Okay, well, good afternoon everybody. Hello, my name is Yvette um, and I'm uh, here to, um, to chair this report out. Um, it's exciting for us this week, as ever, because we have um, uh, our teams reporting out, but particularly because we've got two RPIWs reporting out this week. And remind me, Helen, I think this might be the first time that we've had two RPIWs running simultaneously. It absolutely is the first time we've had two RPIWs running simultaneously. So that'll be, have been quite a stretch for our KPO team. Um, but um, but anyway, here it is. It's Friday and we've made it. The other thing that we're doing that is different is that we are <laughs> beaming over to Chapel Allerton because the Chapel Allerton team are reporting out from Chapel Allerton. So we have to tell them when we're ready. And Chris frantically is to frantically get. trying to... Um, to get I'm a resident technical expert now having to coordinate two reports in two different locations. So the, the theatre team over there are going to be, they've been looking at the changeover between patients and that's been quite a challenge because um, normal operating, as you probably all know, is not really um, going ahead. Um, because of the winter pressures. So I'm sure they will have used their ingenuity and, uh, and managed to find out a, a way of working around that. Also, um, we've got the, um, some of our urology team reporting out. They've had an RPIW so, as well. Um, I'd like to welcome Celeste. Celeste is here from Virginia Mason um, in Seattle, and she's been working with the urology team this week. So, um, everybody's very welcome but it's always special when we've got visitors from outside of the trust as well so i've just got a ring and i'm just bare isn't it how are we doing Chris? <coughs> it's awful isn't it you've rehearsed you've rehearsed you've checked that the technology is working and just at that moment when you uh, yeah that's, that's there we go did it Yay! Oh, let me turn the sound on. Can they hear us, Chris? No. Uh, uh, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> can they see us? Yeah, they can see us. Yes. Time, <laughs> right. So, where can they see? Can they see? Oh, All right. Oh, they stopped. And the So. We seem to be stretching the uh, technology to its abs absolute limits at the moment, which is ironic given we're uh, only a, a mile or so up the road. Um, so it, it, it feels a bit like the Eurovision Song Contest in its early days. So this will be the results from the Chapel Alton jury shortly. Um, but I just wanted to say a few words about this value stream because it's probably going to be the last RPIW that we've done. Um, we've been going uh, for nearly two years now, and um, it's often, often easy to forget the progress that's been made. Um, we were talking about some of these things in guiding team uh, this week, and you just, I, I found myself thinking, oh yes, and we did that, and we did that. So, so it's important, I think, to reflect from time to time, um, and that's certainly what this value stream is going to be. Uh, doing going forward. But for now, we've got a very important uh, RPIW to report out. So without further ado, I will hand over. Thanks, Simon. Hello, my name is Jimmy Parkman. I'm the uh, workshop leader for this RPIW, which is titled Theatre Ready. Um, this is our project form, so it describes processes that are important to providers and important quality and safety steps in what most people would term the turnaround time between theatres. But in Observing this process, what we appreciate is that much of this is non-value added from the perspective of the patient who's waiting for their surgery to begin. So uh, our task was to apply setup reduction principles to try and prepare things ahead of time where possible, and where not possible, reduce the waste in the remaining internal setup. Hi, my name is Laura, and I'm the team leader for this RPIW. Our target progress report metrics. So staff walking distance. This was captured using a standard worksheet 
I calculated our baseline walking distance of two members of the theatre team that were involved in the preparing the theatre for the next patient. The baseline was 285 steps and the target was 145. The lead time was taken from a number of time observations. The baseline was 14 minutes and the target was just low tack time at 10 minutes. The working process was one and the standard working process baseline was two and a target was one. The quality <coughs> defect was looking at loan kit based on November cases, 13.2% of cases used loan kit. The target was 0%. The next quality defect was about staff not feeling they had the ability to improve their work. The baseline was 33.3% and the target was 0%. In regards to 5S work, the baseline was one and the target was four. The tap time calculation, the open hours, are 540 minutes and the demand is four patients per theatre. We set out our target at national target, which is 8% of session time. So the tap time for this process was 10 minutes and 40 seconds. Hello, my name is Lisa, I'm a quality improvement practitioner in theatres and a team member in the RPIW. The value stream this week has focused on the process of preparing theatre for the next patient. This is what we call turnaround. There are various steps within this process that are required to ensure a safe transition between patients. During turnaround, we need to be mindful that there is a patient also waiting for their surgery. By removing the waste in this process, reduces the amount of time and the task required specifically at turnaround, reduces the time patients are waiting. This positively impacts on both patient and staff experience. Communication was identified as a key factor in improving turnaround. The staff in pre wait are not always aware of when the next patient will be called for and the non-clinical support workers didn't find it easy to know when they'd be needed in theatre. The theatre management system can, use, can be used as a tool to monitor the patient's journey through theatre and into recovery. By displaying this on the TV screens that are already available in pre-wait and theatre reception, allows staff to be able to see this information more clearly and, get, and allows them to be able to prepare the patient for theatre. Data is not always accurately recorded on TMS due to the location of the computer in theatres. To improve data collection through the use of existing whiteboards in the anaesthetic rooms will be tested in the next 30 days. From the time observation studies and process maps, we identified the workload of the staff involved at turnaround was unbalanced. Following a review and the allocation of the task, the role of the, the, role of the anaesthetic practitioner changed to allow them to focus on sending for the next patient. Hello, my name is Emily. I'm a perioperative practitioner working in Chapel Hill and Theatres. Whilst we were doing our process for our chart at the start of the week, one of the things that we thought might improve theatre efficiency and reduce the turnaround time was to allocate individual roles to each team member during the turnaround process. We first identified all of the tasks that needed to be completed and then created the standard of work for each team member, which clearly identified what they were required to do. Once we were happy with the standard of work for each team member, we then went to theatre to gather other people's opinions and identify any improvements that could be made. A final draft was made and we then went back to the to trial. We've each filed a number of times and made adjustments based on the feedback we have received. The responses from staff were quite mixed at first, but after a number of trials were carried out in different theatres, people began to be more positive towards the ideas. We also carried out step counts to see how they compared to the original results. Overall, we found that allocating individual roles meant that all tasks were completed efficiently and nothing was being duplicated like it was before. The turnaround time was much lower and step counts reduced from the original data. Hello, my name is Patricia. I'm a non clinical support worker in Chapel Hill Theatre and a team member of the RPIW. When I was asked to take part in the RPI workshop, I was unsure what my tasks were to do, my role efficiently. For example, when to enter theatre to turn around, as this was a big problem for my role as it involved a lot of guesswork, which often resulted in missing turnaround time at the end of operations, as we were often doing other jobs elsewhere. Not duplicating cleaning tasks and making sure nothing is missed in the cleaning process. So the team looked at ways to identify problems and, make, and made a standard work procedure by using task allocation to members of staff. We decided which tasks were appropriate for each staff member and identified who was responsible for each task including a way to alert the non-clinical support workers when theatre was ready for them to enter. So we tried our ideas, including monitoring tasks, step measurements and timing, and came back with some good results. 
We have a few teething problems, but after listening to feedback from staff, we took the two things and tried them again and look at all the results very well. They're also made me aware of some of the challenges other staff members face during turnaround time, and that it holds everyone's roles, not just the cleaning aspect. And I feel more confident in performing my work <coughs> as it has helped to clarify what is required to do my role and work more efficiently as part of the team. Hello, uh, my name is Ben. I'm a consultant in East Pista Works at uh, Chapel Arton and I'm a team member of this RPIW. At the beginning of this week, we went through a process flowchart and used it to identify common barriers to efficiency. Uh, one thread that came out from that was that delays can occur if patients are not being worked up in a timely fashion on the ward, and this often occurs due to communication barriers between the ward and theatres. We have initially explored some IT solutions, but this week we've been trialling a more low-tech solution in the form of a forwarding card. This allows uh, the wards to know the name of the next patient that's expected in theatre and some estimated times of uh, when they'll be required so they can prioritise their work on the ward more effectively. It also has some uh, checklists to identify uh, <coughs> problems early, which may be able to rect be rectified prior to sending for the patients. Um, it may also, may also have some fringe benefits because it may help uh, increase the use of things like oral pre-meds rather than IV drugs and theatres, which may have some cost-saving uh, benefits. We also went into the workplace and did some observation, uh, observation of people's roles. Uh, one thing that can delay the transfer of a patient out of theatre to the end of the procedure is if uh, oxygen and breathing circuits are not readily available. We've tried to now standardise this uh, and use a Kanban card concept to help staff know uh, where to locate these items for a restock if they are missing at the end of the case. Hello, my name is Paul Cowley. I'm one of the consultant surgeons working here at Chapel Arlton and also a team member of this RPIW. And we made some pre-change observations uh, whilst we were in the operating theatre between cases. And I must admit, as a surgeon, and I don't mind including Ben in this, we often don't actually see what happens in theatre between cases. So it's an extreme interest to see the jobs that we're required to have done, the people performing them, and just how we may be able to improve what was already quite a large process to streamline it more efficiently. Now we've got our own ideal scenario of how we might be able to perform this. Uh, main areas to improve are things like communication, notification of pre-weight physiotherapists, <coughs> as well as the post-operative recovery unit to know exactly which patients is coming and when. There's some mistake-proofing steps involved in that scenario so that we know that we're not going to compromise safety for the process of efficiency. As far as the st surgeon uh, standard work goes, uh, there are a few changes to what we usually do. At the team brief, we will notify the staff of what accessory equipment we'll also require intraoperatively, be it clamps, slings or braces after the operation, which is sometimes being sought for but not found. Other things are to estimate the timing of each case, and that's again to notify pre-weight so that they can prepare the next case. And finally, when we finalise the list order in our huddle at the start of each operating list, that is fed back on the phone call that we make to pre-weight anyway when calling for that first patient. This is the baseline that we can then establish and work from in the future for improvements. Hi, my name is Val Davis and I'm the team leader for theatres here at Chapel Allerton and I'm the process owner for this RPIW. I was tasked with 5S improvement and I chose the area of the sluice rooms. The sluice rooms <coughs> is where all the cleaning equipment and necessary stock is kept and is required for health and safety reasons and infection prevention purposes to be clean, tidy and clutter free. <coughs> the stages of 5S are sought to simplify, sweep, standardise and self discipline. I use this framework to remove unnecessary waste and to design and stock in the room as standard. Standard work has been written to assist with the preparation of the sluice room in the morning, to assist with efficient turnaround throughout cases, and staff will be trained in this over the course of the next 30 days. We have also explored over this week standardising the dressing trolleys in theatre using power levels and visual aids called canvas for these stocking purposes. This will be explored over the next 30 days of the 14 agreement. Okay, so the target progress. So for the staff walking, the baseline was 285, the target was 145, and we managed to achieve 140. The lead time, base time, was 14 minutes, the target was 10, and we achieved 
7 minutes and 15 seconds. In regards to the quality defect for the loan kit, this we were not able to make any improvements due to the current state of elective surgery. However, a number of ideas have been generated and added to the parking lot. We remain very optimistic that improvements will be made to this baseline. For staff not feeling that they have the ability to improve their work, the baseline was 33.3% and is now at 20%. The baseline for the 5S was 1 and it still remains at 1, however, there is only a few things to be completed to be able to get to the next stage. Okay. So this is um, our newspaper, this is a live document that, um, produced after the week with uh, this week's task identified on it. It will be updated and progress will be monitored on it and it will be reported out at 30, 60 and 90 days with a view to be completed at the 90 day mark. So um, my opportunity to share some key learnings from the week. Um, the picture here is an ideas form, uh, and it came to me that the team this week have really engaged with involving their colleagues, uh, and that's something that we can all perhaps share from. So rather than telling others that things could be better or how they might be better, to involve them in creating those ideas, testing those ideas, and what we've seen is that does create a better experience for patients and staff. And that's really been largely due to the perseverance and persistence of this team in asking people their opinion and helping to change their mindsets by doing. Uh, so shifting from, it's always been like that, I can't, I won't, or no one listens, to more like, well I'll try, hmm, let me see, maybe we can. And ultimately, what they've reflected on perhaps is that it is hard work, but you get some great results by putting the effort in. A um, couple of other themes. Um, making the right thing to do, the easiest thing to do, has got to be the way forward in any process like this. And similarly, reflecting on comments from the team, that understanding the role of others in any team scenario can really help us move improvement forward. Um, so it leads me to thank yous, to conclude the report out, the whole team at Chapel Art and Theatres who've been really tolerant. Um, it's been an atypical week, as you've heard. Uh, there's not the normal things going on, so some people have been pestered more than others. So special thanks to Hazel Walton for her feedback, uh, Dave Lynn for us interfering with his list, Ruth Drake. Uh, Ian Marr was here with us on Wednesday and used his expertise to help us move this progress forward as a team member. Uh, and to our sponsor, Ruth uh, Chu, who's been involved uh, guiding us with the planning of this event. Thank you. That concludes our report out. Um, I know that the team there uh, are if there are any questions from the room, we're going to take a couple of questions now, then we'll hand back to them uh, and we'll be offline at that point. So, can I invite any questions for anyone in the room? Moira? Um, well, first of all, um, as the CD for Faces and Anesthesia, I just want to say welcome to all of you. We've done a fantastic job here and we've really got everybody else involved as well. Um, obviously, we've got lots of theatres in. Um, in our trust. Uh, do you think there's anything that we could learn for our other 57 theatres? <laughs> I would say some, some of the standardisation work um, would be immediately transferable just in terms of who's doing what in what in theatre. Um, and also in terms of things like the sluices and where the access to equipment is, it's pretty universal I'd say um, across the trust. The, we are quite blessed here in terms of how close our patients are to operating theatres um, and we have managed, even with that, we've managed to cut down the time it takes to get them into theatre and I'm sure some of those lessons could be replicated in terms of communications and more, especially around the list of all the changes which often causes problems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Enormous amount of good work there, and, and a lot of potential, I think, for, for, for future change. Um, one of the lessons we've learned from other RPIWs is that, um, that there's a bit of a lull at the end of the RPIW, and getting the, work, the standard work developed um, becomes uh, becomes difficult to get the teams together to do that. What plans have you made to make make that process easier? Depending? A large, a large amount of it's already drafted up in a week. Um, I think there's different energy with this RPIW, a different level of engagement from the home team. For various reasons, we were completely in their space a week for one. Um, extra people around us at the minute as well, with there being only uh, day cases happening. 
Um, I don't know how well we've got the first draft, but that's just been another week because we've done it throughout rather than leaving yeah. it as a task at the end. I would add to that rather be one, the first draft, I think. Yeah. We as a team have, have gone through draft one to three probably, and the first one that got typed up was probably version four. Um, because yeah. you've tested these ideas, I, I think they've got real value to, to be done on Monday, and that's just about con communicating that with those who haven't been here this week and, and establishing that as a new standard. But I'd be really uh, optimistic about that, uh, and probably more so than in any other uh, event I've, I've been at. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, so a quick message from the Vetman team there, which is coming through the now arcade medium of a text message. So it's well done. Uh, claps that end, really impressed with the work. So I'll close out on that and hand back to St James's. Thanks very much, everybody. Do well. <laughs> right, okay, so um, uh, now then, RPIW 5 for Value Street 2. Um, the process owner is David, um, and, um, and Steve uh, was the, the lead clinician, Steve Prescott. So we'd love to hear what you, how you've been getting on this week on scheduling. Yeah. Hello, my name is Chris. I'm a KPO specialist and I'm the workshop lead for this RPIW. This is the fifth RPIW in Value Stream 2, Abdominal Medicines and Surgery, and this RPIW is looking at urology scheduling. This is our standard work combination sheet, so we're going to be part to a tap time of 15 minutes, uh, which means we have 90 seconds each as a tap time. This is our project form, where the theme of the week was to use a leads improvement <coughs> method to schedule our patients uh, in a timely manner and make sure that we do that once only, um, and then we do not go on to cancel that patient once we've scheduled them for surgery. That results in the current state. So the current state is we have patients in our urology rate waiting list. The average about 17 weeks, but we've got patients on there that have up to 48 weeks. This is after a 12-week outpatient stint with us as well. Um, and then we have to wait for the uh, urology wait, uh, rotor to come out before we can start scheduling them in for surgery. The rotor is an arduous task for one person, and that often results in delays in releasing the rotor. But the impact of that on our patients and our staff cannot be underestimated. And I'm going to let the team tell you about the implications of that and what they've done this week to sort those problems out. Hello, my name is Sophie, uh, team leader for this RPW. Our routine patients uh, were not getting enough notice for their surgery date due to a number of reasons that the, t the team will share. We decided to focus and collect data around uh, creating a theatre list to contacting a patient for uh, surgery. A le our lead time for this for the admin team is 29 days um, with a target of 7 days. This is due to a, a number of reasons around the water. The working process is 175, so that means 175 routine patients were sat on our waiting list. Um, to build quality into this process, we wanted to measure our uh, annual leave and ensuring our staff are given the appropriate notice of eight weeks for annual leave. The baseline for this is currently 16% defective. This links us to being able to lock down a theatre list at seven weeks out to offer our patients six weeks notice for their surgery date. These are 100% defective uh, current state uh, with our targets at zero defects. We also wanted to look at patients that are cance cancelled due to scheduling. Again, our target is 0%. Our 5S measure is uh, an information flow measure and this is across the whole process. So it sounds huge, but we want to streamline our information and ensure that is, uh, uh, we use the 5S tool correctly to do that. This is our ta time ca calculation sheet, which describes our, the time our admin staff have available to do this task, uh, divided by our daily conversion rate with six routine <coughs> patients convert to surgery every day. This means that every 95 minutes we need to successfully add a patient to a theatre list. Here's Abby to tell you a bit of a story. 
Good afternoon, I guess it is. My name is Abi. I'm the Euro Japanese coordinator. Hopefully, you can hear me at the back. Um, <clears throat> from the Leeds way, I'm sure everybody's aware that our focus is on patients. And as such, we looked at our routine patients, called the long waiters at times. And these patients, especially when I speak to them, which is what I do for probably most of my job, uh, my day, they will tell you that they feel we've forgotten about them. And we felt, as a team, that we needed to do something about it. An example of that I'll share with you is um, a 78-year-old lady that I ran to cancel. She was a routine patient. To hear her bursting into tears over the phone, because she was bleeding, the GP had exhausted all options, and there was nothing else the GP could do. She was cancelled because we accommodate an agent patient, which is the case at the moment. So we felt we needed to find <coughs> somewhere where we can allocate these routine patients a slot, which we would ring fence and try to protect. And this is why we came with this. And it left me and my colleagues asking the question, are those routine patients actually routine? Clinically, they might be routine, but when you speak to them and you hear their stories, <coughs> their impact on their lives, their social lives, they can't go to the pub, they can't go shopping, some of it takes a toll on husbands and wives and all around them because they can't be independent anymore. They're just waiting for a date to come in, get this done and be back. Waiting 48 weeks for a surgery, they feel we've taken some 48 weeks out of their lives which they can't get back. And with that, I'll hand you over to our program sponsor. Afternoon, my name is David Golding, Urology Business Manager and Process Owner of this RPIW. As already mentioned, the RPIW is around the scheduling of routine urology in patients. Our routine patients often wait 119 days or 17 weeks from being placed on the inpatient waiting list to being contacted with a TCI date. All our urology scheduling is directly affected by the circulation of the urology rotor. Our 14 urology consultants work on flexible job plans with no fixed individual theatre sessions. The rotor is created by the urology lead clinician. 60% of the time taken to create the rotor is an administration task. It takes the lead clinician 10 hours over four weeks. Um, and this is displayed on our uh, value stream map. So it takes, like I say, 10 hours over four weeks to finalize the rotor, which is for, for the following month. There is often lots of waste that comes out of this. The rotor is then circulated to the urology admissions team with only a week's notice for the, for the month coming up, leaving them with a race against time to arrange pre-assessment, contact patients, populate theatre lists, update TMS and PPM. <coughs> Gillian will now talk about some of the ideas and setup reduction tools we have used to help the lead clinician create a live rolling rotor. Hi, my name is Gillian White, I'm the waiting list coordinator. We came up with the idea of creating a live rotor to help with the flow of information. We identified that additional admin support was required to help create the rotors to input the basic information, information such as annual leave, study leave, order <coughs> days, teaching and bank holidays. This would leave the clinical lead with allocating the surgeons with theatre lists, outpatient clinics, etc., speeding up the process and the right people doing the right jobs. We needed some agreement surrounding this, and I will now pass you over to Victor to explain this in more detail. Uh, thank you, Gillian. Um, hello, my name is Victor Pallet. I'm one of the urology consultants. Um, as you've just heard, that the, the journey for our patients who are waiting on the routine list is not very good. And so we, as a team member of the RPIW, and as a group of the consultants, we thought we need to do something about it. So we set up a, a target of that once in every six weeks we have to do this routine waiting list for, from the list of the long waiting patients. And once we agreed on this, we set up some ground rules for this list and we looked at some of the key elements to help 
uh, provide the list with a smooth and orderly fashion. So the ground rules that we set up for this list is that uh, this list needs to be every six weeks. The list needs to be populated with a long waiting patients. The team with the maximum waiting, uh, uh, maximum waiting uh, groups will take this list first and try and bring this list down as far as possible and then the team will be, all the teams will have an equal distribution of the list. Once the list is being filled with patients and informed, the list will be locked down and cannot be changed unless agreed with the lead clinician or the business manager. In terms of the key elements to smooth out this list, um, we discussed about the schedule, uh, the booking form, which at present many of the consultants or the uh, clinicians do a paper booking form. Now, at the PPM, we've got the electronic scheduling for, um, uh, process to add a document. So we've decided uh, that we'll remove all the paper booking forms from the outpatients and do electronic scheduling. This will not only help us uh, in uh, reducing some of the waste that the admin team goes back and forwards trying to identify the writings of the clinicians to say which, what it is. Um, but also the pre-assessment, when talking to the pre-assessment, they pointed out that this will help them to arrange for the pre-assessment in a more orderly fashion and not some of the patients getting two or three times pre-assessed because they have been waiting for so long time. Um, in terms of the other element that we said we will discuss is the uh, planning meeting for this list, which will happen one to two weeks prior uh, to scheduling of this list. The admin team will send an email to the consultant who will be doing the list and to the theater staff. The team will agree for a date, time, and venue to sit down and agree to a group of patients who will go on this list. Once the team agrees in the group of patients, the admin team will ring those patients, confirm the list, and the list will be locked down. And the ground rules are the list cannot be changed unless again agreed with the lead clinician or the business manager. Um, in preparation of the rota, we discussed quite a few things. And as a, as a consultant body, we feel that we should strive towards providing a eight weeks of <coughs> annual leave, but we haven't still uh, agreed on the final uh, wordings, but to, to help prepare the rota, we should do that. Uh, to give you a perspective what we have done so far, we've already set out a list for 9th of March of this year, agreed with the consultant, fixed number of patients, and it's locked down. And I will hand it over to Abby again to point out some of the nitty gritties of this list. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I think, truly speaking, on behalf of admissions and uh, probably everybody else in neurology, getting to grip with the rotors is one thing that's been so, so frustrating. Like you just said, um, getting a week's notice from the rotors and having to ring these patients, most of our neurology patients on average are elderly and the hot dogs and cats and all these things mm -hmm. that they need to find somewhere to leave them. And these are precious, precious to these people. They can't just dump it somewhere regardless of, what, of how important the surgery is. So we are truly, truly grateful um, to this RPIWO. Yes, as uh, Mr. Pallet has already said, I can confirm that the first list is on. 9th of March, patients conducted, letters have gone, everything is in and the session has been locked. And we're looking at doing this once every six weeks. Hopefully, we did talk about it, we might bring it to one every four weeks to try and utilize the on-call sessions which um, the, 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 the consultants will work on. And one of the sessions has already agreed to do the first couple of them, so we can go probably for the next three, four sessions already, uh, he said, subject to annual leave and all other things, he's available to do that. Um, taking into perspective, most of the long waiters are from like a certain section of the team, of course, um, because of the procedures that they do. Every seven weeks cryo, because we need to give them six weeks, so seven weeks before, we'll hold this meeting, just a quick meeting. Somebody from admin, the session who's going to be running that session will be there. We will take an up-to-date waiting list with all the long waiters. We will go through them, pull a couple of them that the relevant surgeon can do, because not all of them can do everything. 
and we will bring this patient as many as we possibly can fit into that session, confirm send letters, everything, put them on PPM, put them on TMS, lock it, and that will help theatres as well in case they need to arrange some other equipment because most of these are what we call specialist, um, they need specialist equipment or they need specialist um, surgeons to do it. So it goes alongside um, those lines. And we will lock it, and like I said, from admissions, unfortunately most of our consultants are not here. We're going to send the message that once it's locked, don't come to us. <laughs> Go to the new clinician or the business manager if anything is changing. Thank you. So as Abby really well articulated there, we spent the week re-testing this new process, <coughs> bringing patients, using time observation forms to understand how long this process takes. And um, Abby's contact, co contacting of the patient and all the systems he had to go through to go back and forth to check information was taking <coughs> him about 14 minutes. That's been reduced to just five minutes on this form here. Um, but we used all the standard tools, um, and as I say, uh, we were unable, this is our target progress report for after, we were unable to measure our lead time um, because we had to simulate parts of the process uh, due to us not being able to get from the start to the very end of this process all the way through. The whip is still 175, although it says different on there. Um, and <laughs> We've not been able to operate on any routine patients. So, as Abby mentioned, we successfully locked down a list at seven weeks' notice with uh, five patients and giving them six weeks' notice. So, we're currently at zero defects uh, for those measures. Uh, we're still at a level one for our 5S. There is a lot, we're, we're close to being at a level two, but again, these agreements that uh, Victor were discussing need to be locked down with the rest of uh, and documented. So we've got a long way to go, but we've got uh, to improve our information flow. Um, but this is not an easy task. The team have put in so much work this week trying to pick through, sort and, and, and simplify this information. So the burden of work for our admin team should reduce significantly once this new process is fully embedded and sustained to bring the final rotor check a more streamlined process. So the percent load chart here shows what it could look like with a future rotor check compared to the, the, the burden of uh, wasting time uh, of the admin rechecking the draft rotors. Um, so I'll pass you on to David who can speak a bit about our newspaper. So as Sophie's already said, we've already put in a lot of hard work. This is our newspaper that will be working from going forward which identifies uh, the problems that we're working on such as patients given uh, short notice for their routine surgery, uh, the actions that we need to complete, the individual team members that are um, responsible for ensuring those actions are picked up and as you can see most of our work is uh, still in progress, we've got lots of hard work in front of us but we'll be uh, hopefully reporting out in 30 days time with some further <coughs> progress made. So that just leads me to talk about our barriers and key learnings. Um, I think everybody's well aware of the situation at the hospital at the moment, so we've got no routine surgery going on, uh, which has hindered us a little bit, um, and we respectfully would like to ask people in the, in the powers that be that we plan this work in advance now for six weeks' time, and we would hope that with that patient lockdown this could go ahead on that day with all due respect. Uh, the burden of work that we put in place for our staff um, uh, we set up these processes ourselves and we put them in place. Um, but as, as Steve, who's not here today, has said, the, work we, the waste we build into the system, we can take out of the system. We just need to look at it systematically, use our tools, and we can remove that waste. And um, when we're doing our What Went Wells and Even Better Ish yesterday, um, Abby beautifully said, we've done the work in four days that we've been talking about for six years. I think that just shows the power of that. These our KWs can have when we focus our minds and put our hearts into it. Some thank yous. Um, so two team members that can't be here today. So Steve Prescott, who is away today, reliving his youth. Um, <laughs> but he did want to show his beautiful artwork um, that he's done for us. He's at the student reunion, <laughs> so the student reunion today. Uh, and Avril, who unfortunately um, is in surgery today um, and is busily working away. That is Avril. Abby. <laughs> <laughs> she definitely is. Um, 
reliably informed, for example. And then to everybody else, so there's far too many people to mention individually, but the home team. We could not have done any of this work without the home team, so we've been going backwards and forwards all week, pestering them, asking them to test ideas, asking them to what to think about the work we're doing, and they've been absolutely invaluable. So all the people on there and everybody else, and they're all in the audience, so thank you very much to you guys. This team this week have been phenomenal. Um, there's been a lot of hard work, a lot of talk, a lot of action. But you can see the, the work that they've done and the wheels have been set in motion to really, really improve the, the scheduling of our patients. Um, and actually the hard work starts on Monday when this work really, really kicks in. Uh, I'd like to thank Sophie who's going through her certification this week. She's absolutely stepped up to the plate um, and led the team superbly. Um, my two wonderful <laughs> senseis, I'm going to say two senseis because I've got Helen and what Celeste and Helen, yeah. that here, who have absolutely pushed us to the edge but made sure we stayed there and didn't tip us over. Uh, so we couldn't do any of this work without you guys, so that ends our report out. Thank you very much. Well, well done everybody, that's fantastic. and. Um, I popped in to see you on, on Wednesday, um, and um, and it's great to see. Uh, well, you've done an awful lot of work on, by Wednesday lunchtime, but you've completed it, and you know it's really great. And Tim sent um, an email to myself and to David Berridge about the possibility of trying to protect that list on the sixth of March, and. Um, Mike's in the room as well, one of our ADOPs. We, we will do our very best to try and protect that for you. So, um, so fantastic work. And I guess there might be some questions for you. So, anybody got any questions for the team? My, my question is just a comment, really. Um, we always put the patient first. So, in the urology rotor has been a massive issue for years. And absolutely the patient is at the top, but for me the team is just underneath the patient and actually the team have been so demoralised with the rotor issues for the past at least three years that actually this is massive and I think it's bigger than a lot of people really understand yeah. because unless you work in the team you don't really understand the impact of getting a rotor at a week's notice so I think what they've done this week is fantastic. Do you, do you want to say anything? Else? I mean, I'd sort of, I would, I would add to that that you know, you've said that there's an issue that we've been talking about for six years. Um, I think a year ago, if we'd suggested looking at this as an RPIW, I would have said, no, too big a deal. This is too scary an issue to put out there. Um, I think the work that's happened in urology generally, the, the ward teams, the theatre teams, the surgical teams, and the admin teams has just grown that confidence that now we can say there is something that is clear, it's the elephant in the room, it's been the elephant in the room for a long time. This is something that our process should start to tackle and the confidence of the team to actually take on something that is as difficult. It sounds simple, doesn't it? It just sounds so simple. All we need is one surgeon to go into that theatre and then we can allocate patients to it. But once you start looking into it, I came into the room on Tuesday when, and Thursday morning it's like, God, there's so much, it is so complicated. When you start breaking it down into those chunks, it's so complicated. And the confidence to take on something as difficult as combining, producing a rotor with getting the, the scheduling right is, is just really impressive and shows how far the team have come to be able to tackle those sorts of things. I mean, perhaps I could ask you, Victor, you know, was it an eye-opener to you <coughs> to um, realise how much um, it did impact on the the, um, the admin team. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because what I didn't realise was how they worked and how they managed the pre-assessment and the the whole with the ringing and the you know the patients and joining the whole dots together, running backwards and forwards, waiting at the door to see the consultant has finished the, <laughs> the dictation, and then knocking. How much time and effort did the waste? Well, that's what I would say. So it's really you know, it was really an eye-opener, especially also going at the pre-assessment to see how they work as well, and talking to the senior sister over there. So there has been, uh, you know, quite a few. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, um, it's a while ago now, but when Steve was in an RPIW, one of our very early RPIWs, and he'd never been to pre-assessment. Now, as a surgeon, um, it, it, it was a surprise to me 
that actually he had never been, but now you, you, but at least we're getting you there now. I think we might have to do bus trips <laughs> to pre-assessment um, for, our, for our surgeons. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of physicians in the room today, and some other surgeons, but it, it, it's really important that um, I think once, once our consultants realize the impact that they are having on um, administration teams and others, I think they are very willing to change because we've had some of these things that you've raised um, in other services as well. So the forms, the, um, Chris will remember um, people trying to decipher what was written on a form at Chapel Allerton. So using the electronic forms will be a big step forward. And in the main, our consultants, once they know how it impacts, are very um, keen to try and help. So, and that brings it all down to respect, doesn't it? Respect for one another, understanding that we all have a job to do and um, no, nobody, the patient can't benefit unless every team member can do their job successfully. So, any, any other questions? No. Well, thank you very much indeed, Abby, Julian, Sophie, David, and Victor, and uh, we'll give you another. Thank you. Thank you. So now I'd like to welcome Jane, Jane Broxham. Oh, and well, Dave, stay David's for staying for the um, because it's urology again. And they don't say it like that. Yeah, no, like in, a, in a positive <laughs> way. In a positive way. Honestly, for me as, as the exec sponsor um, for this value stream, to be able to see and observe what Tim has described earlier about the, the real changes in urology, um, both cultural and practical for, for the patients, and the innovation that has gone on has been fantastic. So this is your... Uh, report out 210 days on trial without catheter. Seems a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> final, final report summer. out. It used to be summer. It did used to be summer. Uh, just a bit of a recap. I'm not really wanting to go back over it because it is June and it was summer. Uh, but we were trying to ensure really in a trial without catheter TWOC process that we saw this group of patients only once. And that the TWOC, because that's what we'll use, this abbreviation, was performed in one place or the best place. Um, ideally it was going to be the Paul Sykes, um, which is where urology outpatients takes place. But we have a lot of work currently being done in David Beavers and it was to try and streamline that process. Just I like the, the green bits because they're as important bits, 100% quality improvement, 100% safety um, for the patient and the lead time at, uh, at 128 days, that didn't, anyway, whenever it was, months ago, um, was eight days and I did a count this morning and it's six days. So again, this work continues to improve. Um, we aim to bring all the patients back into the Paul Psych Centre as I, swear, as I say, um, but I've underlined the word aimed because it ain't going to happen. So what we've actually done is we've improved the patient experience and recording of that patient experience within David Beavers, which is where a number of patients were being seen. Uh, we've improved the environment for the patient, we've improved the experience, and we'll come on to that in a moment, and we've improved the recording of both the activity on PAS and the GP letters on PPM. Um, my team and, and me, and, and obviously the RPIW is a team, did a lot of work with David Beavers, both education, the nursing staff, and with the reception teams. Um, we needed to do some work on indwelling and self catheterisation within David Beavers, and we've got some patient feedback as well, which has all been positive. Patients knew what were happening, they felt informed. Staff again were able to answer questions. Um, and the patient knew that because they'd had surgery in David Beavers, that they were coming back to that, and they were quite relaxed about that. They felt as though there was some continuity there. So what we in the Paul Sykes did is we have created this virtual telephone, virtual follow-up phone call clinic, quite makes sense, but anyway, it's a virtual clinic, um, which did increase its capacity to see new patients, um, which improved as, as leads time, as I've said. So we've we created patient letters, we formed the <coughs> clinics, we did all those standard work forms. 
I've put patient to impress or unimpressed because it's actually you either like speaking on the phone or you don't um, and it's, it's quite as black and white as that so we have some patients that are very happy to be contacted via phone and are happy to discuss the problems or um, troubleshooting the questions over the phone but then there's quite a lot of patients actually that don't want a phone call and they'd rather be seen face to face um, and I think we have got to respect that that we're probably dealing with a generation that particularly aren't technological so that's as it is, we move what we can. Um, we do see, our, we do do virtual follow-up with all David Weaver's <coughs> patients, um, but we we are increasingly running that towards um, running an, like an acute service, uh, particularly for those that can't access community services. So, if you like a phone call, patients are very positive about it. They enjoy the ability to ask a question and to get their their answers and. Um, have the troubleshooting um, questions answered. We created this central hub where LTHT staff could refer in for a TWOP, uh, or refer the patients in for a TWOP, not themselves personally, I presume. Um, so part of that was to create, create this clear pathway. So we embarked on the information sharing, we worked on digital communications, <coughs> More is going on with that. I said we've created, we have created it, but I don't know it's, if it's entirely used. Um, more work needs to be done on that, and I have got some appointments or some meetings coming up regarding informatics um, to try and smooth, like, smooth out this process. We're still getting a lot of electro um, paper referrals. So out of our, all this work, I guess this is the one bit that is, continues to be a work in progress. And a lot of work has been around improving that patient experience from a community perspective to a LTSC <coughs> perspective. And again, that's going on and current climate, I guess that's just gonna be a long-term, I'm gonna call it a problem, but I, I guess it's, it's long-term work. Um, what has come out, and my team was ward, nurses, discharge team, pulse sites, south patients, um, David as business manager. It's, it's created this increased communication within neurology and it's a bit, respecting each other and expecting each other's workload. Um, again, that's, that does seem as though that momentum has generated and keeps being generated every RPIW. That's excellent. Um, secretarial support was what as my nursing team required as a benign catheter service. Um, that's now in place and it's, it just makes a huge difference to the team. Um, you, you can have slight problems when you don't know where to put a phone and a catheter. <laughs> and, and it just seems to have eliminated some of that. I'll leave that to your imagination. Um, coding. We're going to come on to coding in a minute. Um, we still haven't got this cuddle in the puddle going on. So, urology, uh, nursing teams, admin teams from the Paul sites, outpatients. Um, I suspect on the back of all the RPIWs you do, we're going to need to really improve that. I can see Sinead in the back of the room. And, we need to do it, don't we? Because most of our work is in Paul Sykes, the drop-ins, patients come in because they've nowhere else to go, um, catheter problems, and again, it's rotor issues. We just need to increase this communication even more between ourselves. So I've put some patient responses up, um, and they all think we're wonderful. Apart from the fact that it all makes sense, but do you remind repeating it to my wife? <laughs> 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 and tell twice she, she knows more about it than me so, so again the, you know there is this you know the patient does want to be involved but <coughs> the men at end of day they're very simple little creatures aren't they? <laughs> so to go back to coding <coughs> David explain it explain so <coughs> this like, like Jane said this RPIW seems like a long time ago um, and I think I'd, be, I'd only been in neurology about two to three weeks and I were Left face with me. Face with Jane. So, <laughs> one thing that came out of the RPIW and some of the data that came out was that the amount of uncoded work that was uh, uh, going on for TWAP patients in Paul Sykes. Um, and you'll see from the figures up there that there's still a lot of uncoded work going on. Um, and yeah, you know, we're patient, uh, patient centred, but also. You know we should be looking at making sure that we recover all our income and you know 
build that picture of what's happened to the patient while they've been under our care. And we are coding an awful lot more of the work, so th that success is that, we, we, you know, we're capturing everything. Whether it be the right information or not, that's another question. And I think this is what <coughs> this slide tells that there is work, work that we're doing that we're not coding or we don't have the right set of codes for, um, which is something that myself and JB have uh, talked about that we need to um, eliminate and certainly reduce that 22.35% of uncoded TWOCs moving forward. So there'll be, you know, there's things that happen um, within outpatient and outpatient with procedure that we need to get to the bottom of and get the right <laughs> codes so that the nursing team and the clinicians can, you know, just ensure that that's recorded properly. I think it will help as well once we move to an electronic uh, attendance sheet or RTO5. Um, yeah, I, can't add, no, I can't add anything, you've done excellent. Oh. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, it was my mistake. I didn't realise we had another uh, report out, another update from Acute Medicine. So I'm going to say we'll move straight on, but thank you very much, Janie. Thanks for sticking with it. So Charlie and Adam, um, Acute Medicine, and reporting out on, or updating, 60 days on the ward round. Um, so our entire value stream is basically focusing on the 14-hour standard uh, time to consult and review. Um, and this slide's just showing where we were at the very start, so it took the patient around 23 hours to, uh, from the time we got onto the ward to see a consultant. Um, so for those who are familiar with the RPIW so far, this is just showing you kind of the four things that we're focused on throughout it. So the first one was creating a lean handover, a lean central handover, and implementing more focused local handovers. Um, the second bit was setting up the ward rounds for success um, with standardised pro formers, use of things such as wows during the ward round and doing actions as the ward round progresses rather than waiting at the end for the MDT. Um, the third thing was the introduction of a standard ward round pro forma, um, which ensures that like key metrics are completed during the course of the ward round and updated on PPM. And um, the final thing that we looked at was evening ward rounds. Um, so that was particularly in elder medicine because acute medicine already do one. Um, and just an update from last month, we've agreed with the geriatricians now that we're going to implement an evening ward round, um, and that's being job planned at the moment. Um, so the handovers, the central handover has probably been the big, biggest success of our value stream so far. So it's gone from <coughs> having around about 30 people in a room for up to 20 minutes at a time, going over information that's already been reported to um, just seven people. Um, and we've kept it consistently at under nine minutes uh, throughout the, the course of the value stream. So it's an established process um, now. And another benefit of that is that they, on the night handover, they've, been, they've implemented um, a lot of pro forma that's taken from the one that we've done in the morning. So it's kind of an unintended success that we've had um, for downstream. And that's because they thought it would better set them up for doing their job on, on the night shift. Um, so the other thing that we've looked at this month is trainee feedback because we didn't um, focus on that as much last month um, and one thing that the handover is supposed to do is make sure that everybody's clear on the role within the ward round um, so out of the trainees that we um, give the questionnaire to everyone either agreed or strongly agreed that they knew what their role within the ward round was and um, the next bit the handover is just supposed to make sure that the ward rounds planned effectively and there was only one person who disagreed and said, well, strongly disagreed in fact, um, but said that they didn't think that the ward round was planned effectively and, and the rest agreed. Okay, <clears throat> uh, I'm Charlie Wilkins, I'm one of the other process owners. So um, uh, we mentioned the pro forma. Uh, one of the problems we've noticed with the pro forma is that the different ward areas, and there's four wards on the acute floor, we're doing different things with the pro forma. So we tr tried to standardise that, which is what we've done uh, during the last uh, 30 days. Uh, the other uh, it, the thing that came out of the workroom was that um, we didn't really know which consultants were turning up to each ward area in the morning, so that's something that we're working on to try and get that visual um, timetable, so that's 
uh, hope you come online. It is now it's, there. It's online now, yeah. So, um, and uh, with regards to pro forma, we're, we're now moved on to stapling them on the net, so it's a rather high-tech uh, thing that we've done. Uh, and getting the junior doctors also to staple in when, because um, some, we're using these clerking booklets at the moment. Uh, next one. So um, these are the timings that we've been doing. Um, so you can see that there's the baseline one. Uh, so, the, so the lead time, so that's the time per patient. Um, and what we wanted to do was to uh, increase the value added time, which was we thought uh, was the time spent with the patient. And you can see that during the RPIW week, we improved the time with the patient, uh, but slightly increased the lead time. And then we were very pleased with ourselves because we managed to get the whole uh, lead time down to 12 minutes during the 30-day report out. But of course, uh, we're in the middle of a slight flu outbreak at the moment. So uh, <coughs> that, uh, this week, I timed one of my colleagues, and they were taking 20 minutes uh, with the patient. But they were actually, the interview time was quite good, so it was 8 minutes and 20 seconds with the patients, uh, but they're ta putting on, taking on masks and putting on gloves and things, so this is going to slow the, the wall ground down, but uh, in terms of the middle of the winter uh, sort of pressures, we're hoping the data isn't uh, um, bad, they're still working on it. Um, so uh, just a bit of an update about the proforma itself. Uh, this is a uh, pre and post ward round, so this is on ward 29, you can see uh, the one on the uh, right. So the idea is that when the consultants review the patient, they click uh, this button. I don't know if you can see that it goes from red to green. So you can see over on the right side, the consultants seeing the patient, apart from this one. Um, so this gives you a visual check so if people know where the board, how the ward rounds are progressing. Um, and um, we wanted to see some quality, the, the, the pro forma working. You can see that when we got them to use the pro forma, we got a sea of green. Okay, there are a few reds and you never going to hit 100% of it, though, but this was after the war ran before the MDT, so that's what we'd like to see. Uh, and we do, from, from what we've been looking at, we think the performer definitely works in terms of getting these quality metrics done. Uh, but as I mentioned at the last report out, we are uh, still experiencing some slight uh, problems trying to get everybody on board with it, uh, and reasons for that, uh, speaking to a lot of colleagues working on downstream wards, is because uh, the pro forma is essentially a loose piece of paper um, and when the patient moves off the acute floor, ward clerks, either in the Bexley or uh, Glenn Helbing, take it out and file it in different places. So that's why we're going towards the new uh, stapling option. Um, so, um, and we're also, uh, when our sponsor moves back onto the acute floor, uh, we're going to uh, relaunch the pro forma to get it back on, uh, on track. Um, so this is just showing where we are um, now we're at 60 days um, so the lead times actually increased to around about the same time that it was um, during the end of the RPIW but it's pretty much down to winter pressures um, plus J27 that we mentioned it on has got an extra six beds and they're seeing a lot more outliers that they uh, weren't when we measured the initial baseline target um, so although it has, it has got worse um, it's kind of to be expected I suppose um, the other thing that we've looked at throughout again is the, the 14 hour standard. Uh, we haven't really focused on the acute medicine side of it because they already have an evening ward round in place and you can see that their metrics have pretty much stayed consistent throughout the 60 days. Um, whereas elder medicine and doctor currently haven't, um, but we're going to be in, implementing um, an evening ward round with <coughs> only 50% of the patients who we measured um, were seen within that 14 hour target this month. Um, so that's obviously something that we're looking to improve on. But that's why that um, figure's fallen. Um, the pro forma um, looks at these three metrics, which is the VT status update, <coughs> the oxygen therapy, not co uh, correctly prescribed, and appropriate cannula. Um, so the um, VT stats have improved from the baseline this month, but actually got a little bit worse than last month, and I think that's probably because of the uptake of the pro forma, on, particularly on J29, where um, only around half of the patients had um, a VT status updated and they're one of the ones who aren't using the pro forma as regularly. Um, we've also continued to improve on the baseline for oxygen uh, therapy, so that's improved by around 30% over the course of the first 60 days. Um, however, the patients not having the appropriate cannulas has uh, got a little bit worse, so by 9% this month, but we're not quite sure why that is. It might again be to do with the lack of uptake of the, the pro forma. 
Um, another thing we looked at was the trainees who um, don't agree or strongly disagree that the live round offers um, an opportunity to learn for them. And that's um, improved from the baseline target by around, uh, around 22.5%. Um, and then finally, just the, the setup reduction, and that's uh, to do with the handover, um, and that's gone from 21 minutes and it's kept consistently under the nine minute target um, throughout 60 days. With the last one just measuring it just under nine minutes, eight minutes 59, which is quite lucky. So, the key learnings and challenges, um, one of them's been the teamwork, which Charlie's kind of already said, we're looking at the buy in. Um, for the pro forma and we're relaunching this with our sponsor. Um, winter's obviously been a challenge, the ward rounds are taking longer, we've got more outliers, um, we've had another ward open um, unexpectedly, um, and the actions um, are, are now getting done in the MDT as they were before the RPIW as opposed to what we wanted to do, which is to do it during the course of the ward round. Um, and then another challenge which we found, we track, one of the things which we tried to implement was people using WOWs as the um, going through the uh, the ward round, so that they are each had an allocated workstation. Um, but the feedback on that is they're not particularly user friendly when you try to write notes on them. Um, they have not the space, which is why people prefer working at kind of desktops, which there's not enough for like one each. Um, and then the last slide is just thank yous to the the ward teams across the big floor and just for being patient with us while we're implementing these improvements um, and. The away team have continued to meet us each week as well, so I just want to say thank you to them. Um, Yvonne keeps helping out with the money handover, making sure it's kind of keeping under that target and um, helping with things like the, the rotors. And then Emma and the ward clerks have just been really helpful um, for standardising the, the documentation and, and processes across the ward. Any questions? Honestly, thank you very much, and um, I think it's really interesting to see the work, to see the changes, and it's fantastic that I know because of all the pressures that you're all under that you've continued to do this and you've, and you've done the remeasures, so thank you very much. Um, from my observations, I think, you know, the um, actually it's really important that we understand it takes longer to see the patients. It, it sort of goes without thinking that yes it will take longer if you've got to gown up and de-gown but on the other hand you've measured it and you've shown the impact that has and that's something we have to consider <coughs> particularly it's important we feed that back in Steve through the dot routes because um, th those are our daily operational meetings where sometimes it's there's a bit of frustration about why the doctors haven't got round all of the patients but you know it's a reality of life isn't it it takes longer um, and I guess there are one or two things that if you're not able to overcome become patient safety issues because if you're able to demonstrate that this pro forma makes a difference to what you're doing for the patients and then you know the VTE risk assessment is something that helps to keep our patients safe then maybe that's something Steve we would want to discuss in stand up so um, so those are things that are my observations but anybody got any um, comments or questions for the team for Adam and Charlie I can't not take the opportunity yeah. <laughs> I've got to respect the eyes for, you know, <coughs> for managing to keep doing this with the, with the pressures that are on but I just wanted to highlight the fact that the handover process which often you do people get used to it and then they go back to the old ways there's real evidence that it's not only sustained, but it's now um, uh, allowing the night team to, to do the same thing because of that embedded process. And it, it really seems to be a vault change in how people are approaching the handover with the robustness, patient safety, the clinical information that's needed, but all of the extra stuff that wasn't adding value, people just recognize we don't need to do that. That's fantastic. It, it, thanks, Steve. And I think that you know the the rotor issues. It's interesting, isn't it, that we haven't planned it this way, but <coughs> hearing about the impact of the consultant rotor in urology, and then the impact of the consultant rotor in acute medicine. So very lots of similarities there as well. Um, so and and actually something you know urology have wanted in f something for six years, 
I've been here just short of five years and elderly medicine evening ward rounds is something. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, so uh, you know, Charlie, you're, you're here from elderly medicine. I'm trying to see who else. <coughs> Hannah's one of the acute medics. But that that's really um, good. And, um, I, you know, I know that it's taken a lot of discussion and change in job plans. So, so well done, everybody. So that has been a fantastic report out. We've overrun a little bit, but given the two RPIWs, technology from Chapel Allerton as well, we've heard some really great things. So thank you very much, everybody. And well done. To you.